Amen. What a thrill it is to be here today. I am here by divine appointment. And I don't say that lightly. Um, in 50 years of preaching, I started preaching when I was 15 years old. I am now 65. I have never in 50 years invited myself to preach. Never. However, about three weeks ago, I was, I've been scheduled for the last six months to do um, a leadership summit in Corona for, for the pounds uh, on Saturday, on Friday and Saturday alone for the Eli Hernandez that they set up at my church in Vegas. And so we were scheduled to do that, and Brother Zeriak, that pastors under Brother Pounds, the church in Vesperia, he had, he's out of my church in Vegas, and he had been after me, Pastor, I want you to come preach. I want you to come preach. you got to come to High Desert and preach. And um, so Brother Pound said, they really want you to preach up there on Sunday. And they have church at 1130. And immediately the Lord spoke to me and said, you're going to go to Barstow for 10 o'clock. And I said, well, I know that's my son in the gospel out there, you know. But I've never invited myself to preach at anybody's church, not even my son's church <laughs> in the gospel. <laughs> and so I called him up, and I said, Brother Scott, what time is your service? He said, well, we have Sunday school at 10, and we have our normal service at 11. And I said, well, I'm going to come and be in your 10 o'clock service to be support for you. He said, if you're going to do that, you're going to minister. And I said, well, that wasn't what I called you about. He said, no, no, if you're going to be there, you're going to preach. Or teach. And so immediately the Lord gave me a word. Now, you understand, three weeks ago, Brother Hicks was not this sick. Okay? No, we were just finding out about things. Still trying to determine what was going on. But the Lord never makes a mistake. His timing is impeccable. Now, I love Brother Hicks. Y'all need to understand that. He was my friend. We've been to car auctions together. We've done all kind of things, and I'll tell some funny stories about that at another time. I'll tell you a story about me meeting him at a service station and singing to him one day. <laughs> Two things he loved. He loved church, and he loved preachers. Now, I'm going to tell you he did. He was a preacher's friend, and he was mine. And we'll talk about that. But today, I have a word from the Lord for all of us. If you have your Bibles, turning with us to 1 Timothy chapter 6. I even did a handout. Um, that's something I never do. Because he told me it was a Sunday school class, so I decided I would just slow it down and teach. If you know me very well, it's hard for me to slow anything down. When I teach, I tell. When I preach, I yell. When we get through, we'll figure out what I did. If that's fair enough with you. But in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning with verse number 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. Let me stop right there for a second. I'm going to read some more in a minute. How many of you would be honest enough today to say that where you are right now in life, the house you're living in, the car you're driving, uh, the status of life you're in right now is better than the part you were born with. Anybody? Anybody been blessed above what you were born with? <laughs> I mean, I was. there were six in our family. There were four boys and mom and dad. We all lived in a 900-square-foot house with two bedrooms, one bath, and a path. Now, you're not country enough if you don't understand what the path was all about. We were... There were four of us boys in a 10 by 10 bedroom. We had two sets of bunk beds. I didn't know I was poor until I got to college. Honestly, I didn't. I thought everybody had four boys in a 10 by 10 bedroom. But when I look at things where I am today, God has blessed this country boy. And I think there are a bunch of us in here today that could say, I have been blessed. I am further ahead than where I was when I came into this world. You know, we, my wife and I dated in a 65 Chevrolet carry-all van. 
That was before vans were cool. We had the 460 air conditioner unit in it. 41 just down 60 miles an hour. I didn't know what an air conditioner was till I was a junior in high school and we got a little window unit air conditioner for the house and we used to take turns sitting in front of it. Okay, so y'all weren't poor. I was. But this scripture says we brought nothing into this world. And you're not going to have a U-Haul behind your hearse. You understand? You're not going to take anything out. The next verse says, And having food and raiment, therefore let us be where therewith be content. But they which will be rich fall into temptations and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Oh, how people search to be rich and they lose everything. For the love of money is the root of all evil which while some covet after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. How many people, how many people have given up living for God because i got to work two jobs? Oh, i got to have more money. i got to have a bigger house. got to have a newer car. You know what you really need is a little more God. But the next verse is where I want to base from today. Fight the good fight. Everybody say good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. I want to teach or preach a little while today. Fight the good fight of faith. Dear Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for these wonderful people that have come to hear the word. Anoint your servant. Your word is already anointed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. You may be seated, please. Again, thank you, Brother Scott. I count it such an honor to stand in this pulpit. What a great work this man's doing for God in this city. Amen. I am so proud of him and his family and what God is doing here. And I'm believing that God is going to work some miracles in the short, near future about what's fixing to happen around here. Now I realize, as I said earlier, I came from a different generation. I came from a generation where we could get along or we could go out back and get it on. I mean, if we couldn't solve it one way, I mean, I lived in a city that had two, it had two high schools. It had the rich kids high school and the poor kids high school. I grew up going to the poor kids school because we were poor. When I made up my mind to live for God and decided I was going to sell out everything and be, be a preacher, I decided to go to the rich kid school, and I sure didn't fit in over there. Now, the problem is we played football between the two high schools, and here was kind of the rule of the game. If you didn't win the game, you always won the fight after the game. Now, you didn't hate one another. You just knew there was going to be a good fight after the game. That was just part of the culture of where I was raised. I was raised with a culture of fighting. I'm not talking about shooting and cutting one another and doing all the crazy stuff they do today. I'm talking about just get out back and get it on. And when it was through, you'd go eat together. You weren't mad then. You just figured out who won the fight and who lost the fight. And when you lost, you learned to say, okay, I lost. I give, uncle, I quit. But we fought and we learned to fight. Now, thank God we've come a long ways and. We're not there anymore, and times have changed. But I want you to understand something. In the spiritual, you're going to have to learn to fight the good fight of faith. God called you out of the world. You're going to have to fight to stay out of sin and out of the world. The Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. God gave us weapons to fight with. And we have to learn to use those weapons so that we can fight this good fight of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I like to slip a little word in there that doesn't change the meaning of that scripture, not yet seen. Because you see, if God said it, it's going to happen. But Satan never fights fair. How many of you know that? 
Oh, he'll attack your faith. He'll attack your finances. He'll attack your family. He'll, he'll attack everything. But God said, don't lose your faith. You may lose a lot of things. You know, we live in a day and an age when people have, have cell phones and they have things on them that says, find my phone. Anybody ever lived with anybody that lost stuff all the time? Okay, there's a couple of you. Don't raise your hand real high. You'll be in trouble for you. My mother-in-law could lose her keys more times than anybody I'd ever seen. She just put her keys down, and I loved my mother-in-law. But she could never find her keys. And she always wanted to borrow my pen. And I never got my pen back. I used to carry two pens. I would buy the cheapest pen I could find because I was going to loan it to her. She would say, I want to use your good pen. No, Mama, you can't have my good pen. I love you. But, you know, I don't want to be mad later that you stole my good pen. That was Mama for you. I called her Mama. She's my mother-in-law. But that was Mama for you. She was going to lose her keys every time she put them down. And now they said, you know, and, and we finally bought her one of those things that you could whistle, and if you whistled, it would respond, and we put it on her keychain, and she lost it anyway. I mean, that was just her. But, you know, some people lose everything. But the one thing you better never lose, and that's your faith. Whatever you do, don't lose your faith. When you got saved, all of your problems did not go away. Some people think the minute they get the Holy Ghost, they're going to wake up tomorrow morning rich and skinny. It didn't happen. Thin may be in, but fast words at. Okay? I just need you to understand that. You did not get the Holy Ghost, wake up tomorrow morning rich and skinny. It just didn't happen. You're still going to have problems the day after you get the Holy Ghost. You understand that? If you owe IRS money the day you get the Holy Ghost, you're going to owe IRS money the day after you get the Holy Ghost. But you see, the difference is you woke up the next day with Jesus on the inside. Uh, he's working on the outside. Uh, oh, what a change in my life. Uh, there's something about it. Uh, all of a sudden, when I woke up the next day, uh, I woke up with faith on the inside. Uh, whatever it is, uh, don't lose your faith. Uh, when God gives you faith, don't lose that faith. So the first thing in your study guide today is don't lose, lose anything, but don't lose your faith. Don't lose your faith. God will give you new direction and he'll give you new help when he gives you the Holy Ghost. Your problems are going to stay the same, but what will happen is you're going to start having that faith of God to fight those problems. When that faith kicks in, you realize that the God you serve is bigger than your problem. Uh, you need to get out of this. You need a checkup from the neck up and get rid of stinking thinking. You don't need grasshopper mentality. The children of Israel said when they looked at the giants, uh, they are giants in the land, and we are in our sight, but as grasshoppers. Now, Vegas just had an invasion of grasshoppers. I don't know whether you all saw that in the news or not. The newspapers all over the world were carrying it. People were calling me from literally all over the world saying, Brother Blizzard, y'all got an invasion of grasshoppers? I said, yeah, them little hopper grasses are running around here everywhere. I mean, they go, Brrr. I said, the neat thing is they're attracted to light. I said, and so they're all down on the strip where all the idiots are. <laughs> they're drawn to the light. I live in a community that does not have its rural community, so it doesn't have street lights. I said, they really haven't bothered us very much where I'm at. But I love all those 20,000 of my closest friends that are walking down the strip tonight fighting grasshoppers. But you get grasshopper mentality, if you will. That's what happened to the children of Israel. They saw themselves as being small. I'm talking to somebody today. You don't need to see yourself as being small. You need to see yourself as knowing that God is on your side. Romans 12 and 3 says, God has given to every man the measure of faith. 
faith. Uh, you see, when he gave you the measure of faith, he knew what you were going to fight. He said, you need this much faith. And he looked at you and he said, you need this much faith. And you got to have this much faith. And you got to have this much faith. Why? He knows the everywhere I'm at. Uh, he knows the way that I take, Job said. Uh, when I've been tried, I'm going to come through it. And God gave to every man the measure of faith. Uh, he gave you enough faith to walk this way. He gave you enough faith to trust him. He gave you enough faith to finish the journey. God gave you the faith you needed. And I'll tell you something else. God gave Brother Hicks enough faith uh, to finish his course uh, and keep the faith. You see, there's a difference between faith and miracles. There's a difference between faith and miracles. Three Hebrew boys going through a fiery furnace. A miracle would have blown out the fire. But faith will walk you through it. The miracle would have healed Brother Hicks. But the faith took him home. You understand the difference? Oh, we want the miracle. We want the miracle. Every time, we want the miracle. Sometimes God just wants us to have the faith. There's a difference between miracles and healings. You hear me? I used a box cutter one time, and I cut my hand right there. And, uh, and man, it started bleeding like crazy. Well, I just grabbed it and pinched it back together and got some duct tape. Fellas, you know what I'm talking about. You ever did heat and air conditioning work? You know what duct tape's all about. You just tape it up and go on. And and that thing was ugly. And my wife said, "No, you better go." So I went down, and sure enough, they they decided they needed to put stitches in that thing. I didn't want stitches. Never had stitches in my life. So they stitched that thing. I told the doc. I went to the quick care. I said, "Look, I'm on a flight in an hour and a half. Either y'all get me sewed up." Oh, well, yeah. There's 15 people. I said, "Sir, either y'all get me sewed up." I am going to put some duct tape on that thing and get back on that plane. Five minutes later, I was in there. They put two stitches in it and, uh, and sent me off on the plane. I said, is it okay for me to fly out like this? <laughs> but you know what happened? I didn't wake up the next day and that was gone. It took week, It took days for those stitches to, to dissolve. And then there was a scab on that crazy thing. But you know what? Over time, it healed. Okay? Sometimes God heals our bodies, and it takes time. Now, miracles means, boom, it's all over. There's a difference when you have faith to say, God, I'm going to trust you through the healing process. I'm going to trust you. Job would say, though he slay me, I will still trust him. Though the skin worms destroy this body, in my flesh I'll see the Lord. You see, these three Hebrew boys, I, they needed their faith when the miracle didn't come. See, when the miracle didn't come, it didn't change the story. The story was, now the miracle would have blown the fire out. That would have been the miracle. It would have blown the fire out. But it didn't come. The king said to them, they said, now what are you going to do? And they said, oh, king, we're not careful how we answer you. We know that our God is able to deliver us. And then there were three faithful words that were said next. But if not. <laughs> but if not. <laughs> but if not, uh, we will be delivered from you one way or another today, O king. Uh, we're not worried about it. Uh, I know my God is able, but if not, uh, I'm going to walk right on through anyway. Uh, the king got so mad, he said, you fire that furnace up. Uh, you're not going to defy me. I'm the king. I'm in control. And they threw him in until the guys that threw him down the chute died from the heat. The king rose up and said, now what you going to do about it, boys? <laughs> and he looked through them. And his knees started to shake. He said, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? That's right, king. He 
said, Lo, I see four. <laughs> oh, hold on a minute. Uh, hold on a minute. Uh, they ain't bound no more. Uh, they're dancing now. Uh, they're dancing now. Uh, they're not bound anymore. The only thing that's left them uh, were the things that bound them when they went in. Uh, I'm talking to somebody today. Don't lose your faith. Because God has set things free. You understand, God burned off those things. I preached a message. Let me tell you something else. When they came out of that fire, the king, the king said, there's no God but your God. Anybody says anything about their God, they're dead folks. They're, that God is the real God. You see, they had to go through the fire to get the testimony. Don't lose your faith. Don't lose your faith. Don't lose your faith. Because faith will fight your fears. Faith will fight your fears. Oh, I don't know, God. I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. When God puts you to bed in the dark without a nightlight, faith will fight your fears. The enemy tries to put a spirit of fear on you. Things will happen to us in life. I was 25 years old. I was national sales manager for a company. Traveled all over. They sent me to California. I'm an old southern boy in a little bitty town in Bibb City, Georgia. And here I am traveling all over the country for this company, making more money than I ever dreamed I would make. And um, They sent me to California. I opened a company in Santa Cruz and living it big. And then they did me wrong, and I decided to go in business for myself. So at 26 years old, I owned my first company, and in six months' time, now you got to understand, this is back in the 70s, and in six months' time, I'm paying myself $1,000 a week. I have a brand-new Olds 98 luxury sedan. I have a new home. I have $44,000 in cash in the bank in six months of being in business. God had blessed this old country boy, and I took on a business partner. He was 50 years old, and he, he was going to double the size of my business in the first 90 days. He, we had dreams. We had everything going. And I took him on and made him a full partner. He didn't have one dime in it. He just came in to be my partner. And three weeks later, he took every bit of my money and went to South America. And I lost everything I had. I went to bed one night, a fairly wealthy young man. I woke up the next morning bankrupt. And I began to wonder what was going to happen. As a matter of fact, that night when it all happened, I, I'm, a, I'm a redneck. I was going to get my gun and go find him. Until I found out he went to South America. I didn't want to go that far. I wasn't that redneck. But I honestly didn't know what I was going to do. I was, I was never suicidal, but I was at a point I didn't care if I lived or died. I thought my whole world would end. I left my attorney's office that day, and he said, son, I'm going to have to file a bankruptcy. You've lost everything. They're going to put you in jail. I had written checks for $5,000 because I was ordering supplies. He said, when those checks come in, you're going to jail. I said, I didn't do anything wrong. The money was in the bank when I wrote that. He said, it didn't matter. And my attorney gave me bad advice. I, I was young and dumb, and I trusted him. And so I filed the bankruptcy. I did everything I was, you know, he told me to do. And that night I couldn't sleep, and so I wrote, wrote out to the lake. And it's about 1.30 in the morning. I walked way out on the dock and sit at the end of the dock out there by myself at a, at a podium. There's nobody there. Nobody was there but me. And in a little while, a police officer walked in. He said, you okay? He said, no, I just want to be sure that, uh, he said, what's going on? I said, well, my business partner wiped me out, and I'm trying to sort things out in my mind. And he said, I, we're losing our home, we're going to lose our car, we're going to lose everything, and I, I'm, I'm pretty much a failure right now. 
c'est lui qui a été Dieu, qui a été l'agneau scié, qui a été l'agneau immolé. Et c'est not your job to go look at about 23 drops of his blood. I said, for what? All I do is heavy work. It's cold. I just get wet. I said, I'm an Olympic swimmer. I can swim two miles. So just jumping in there, <laughs> all I'm going to do is get wet and mad. Man, no, no, I'm not going to jump. I said, I cliff dive from 60 feet. So what am I going to do jumping off this bridge, this piece of rock? And he left. Sitting on that rock that day, faith showed up. Faith has shown up. I'm sitting there saying, God, I'm having a pity party. Anybody ever had a pity party? I'm talking about a first class pity party with the hats, the streamers where you sent out engraved invitations, calligraphy invitations. Man, you, I was having one of them. You know the problem with pity parties? Anybody shows up, don't bring a gift. They don't. Think about that for a minute. And the only time God ever shows up at my pity party is to kick me out of it. I mean, he don't show up to, and say, oh, you poor thing. No, he shows up to kick me out of it. And so God showed up. Faith showed up right on that dock that night. And God said, well, sometimes you win. Sometimes you learn. He said, be not unequally yoked with the unbelievers. I thought that meant marriage. God said, you didn't even pray about that. Take it on that rock. And he wasn't going to let that whole bunch of people go. What did you expect? Number one, you were thinking in the worldly way, business. So I did some repenting on that day. And God said, I'm still the same God. I'm still the same God. I'm the one that blessed you the first time. I'm the one who can bless you the second time. You're going to have to learn to trust me. Where did your faith go? You're sitting out here having a pity party when you ought to be praising me that I protected you. Let me tell you something. As I went down the road of life, one year later, I had a newer car, a bigger house, more money in the bank, and no business partner. Why? Because my God was still in charge. God made the enemy pay back everything with interest before it was over. You see, faith keeps company with life. When Jesus was crucified, he said he would rise on the third day. Now Mary headed out to the tomb the morning of the third day. The soldiers did not believe it, uh, but even that, they sealed it as tight as they could. Uh, they stood watch over it, but nonetheless, on the third day, when you read about Mary getting up to go to the tomb, uh, she didn't go down there to see if he was still there. She gathered together the oil. Uh, she gathered together the spices, uh, and she went down there for a reason. He said he was going to be there. Uh, I'm going to go take care of business. Uh, I'm not going down there to see see what's going on. Uh, I'm going down there because I have faith. Uh, somebody's faith needs to kick in today and know that God's still in control. Uh, God didn't die. God's not sick. Uh, he's still there. She took her anointing oils with her. I remember when back in 1972 I was in Bible school and uh, I, uh, I got a phone call you got to understand, I talked about my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law was actually my pastor. And she never believed in women pastors. Yeah, that does a whole other story. It's the funniest story how God does things. She really never believed in it. And um, she was teaching, she was actually working in a cotton mill in the 50s. And she's standing outside before work reading from her Bible out loud. And people would gather around to hear her read. And so she was reading Acts chapter 2. And all these people were standing around there. And she said, and then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of your sin. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And she looked around and she said, If you've not been baptized in the name of Jesus, if you've been baptized in the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that's not the way they were baptized in the book of Acts. 
some lady came up to her and she said, no, you're mistaken with that, Alice. She said, am I? Let's look at the Bible. And so she began to show her in the Bible what it said. And she said, I just think you're confused. She said, well, show me where I'm wrong. So the next week, this lady comes up to her and she said, you know, I went and talked to my pastor about this. He wants you to come to our Bible study on Saturday night. He wants to show you something. She said, okay, great. I'd love to come. So on Saturday night, she goes to the Bible study. There's about 38 people there, she said. And, um, and so the pastor says, Alice, I understand that you were reading in Acts chapter 2, verse number 38, about baptism in Jesus' name. But in Matthew 28, 19, it says, "Be go ye there. This is Jesus speaking, and that's not Jesus speaking there. She said, now wait a minute. Jesus didn't write a single word in this book. She said, okay, so let's just understand. We're not going to sort it out as to who, who wrote and said. We're going with the Word of God. It's infallible. And she said, let's look in the book of Acts. And she said, if you show me one place in that Bible where somebody was baptized in actual baptismal service, where they said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, she said, I'll eat that Bible, including the cover. She said, but I can show you time and time and time again where they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And she began to walk him through it and all of a sudden it was like Azusa Street. He said, I see it! I see it! I see it! This is about 9 o'clock on a Saturday night and he said, Alice, you got to baptize me in Jesus. She said, no, no, not me. Not me. No, no, no. I'm a woman. No, no. He said, Alice, let me ask you a question. I see the revelation. If I'm killed in a car accident tomorrow before we can find a preacher to baptize me in Jesus' name, do I go to heaven? She said, uh, no. He said, then I'm not taking that chance. You're the only one that I know that's been baptized in Jesus' name. You're going to baptize me. She baptized him. He baptized 37 other people that night in Jesus' name. He said, would you come back next Saturday night and share some more of this? She said, oh, I'd love to do that. She gets there the next Saturday night. They hand her a letter. It said, dear Alice, I got so excited about the revelation of the oneness of God and baptism in Jesus' name. I called my relatives in Louisiana. And they all want me to come out here and baptize them. So I am going to Louisiana to baptize my family. Please feed this flock for the next three weeks and I'll be back. No problem. She had three good Bible lessons. So she showed up three Saturday nights in a row and she's teaching Bible. They're having, there's a man there in the church that's baptizing because every week they got people getting the Holy Ghost. On the fourth Saturday night, she shows up. They hand her another letter. Dear Alice, I've had 200 receive the Holy Ghost in Louisiana. I started a church here. You'll have to take care of that one. I'm not coming back. So she called the UPC. The, she called the assembly. She called everybody she could find that was apostolic and said, please send a preacher. And there's not one preacher wanted to go to Columbus, Georgia. It was a military town. So she didn't have any choice. 37 preachers came out of that church, by the way. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting thing. But in 1972, I was in Bible college in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I got word, I got a phone call that she was dying and that the doctors had given her less than a month to live. She had osteomyelitis, six inches of her back. Her spinal column was gone. It was eaten up. She was an invalid. And um, the night I got the phone call, I went in, quit my job, loaded my car, and started driving home. And I, um, I drove the 1,350 miles that I got in at 2 o'clock in the morning the following day. Um, and I went straight to the hospital, went up the back stairs, went into her. She was asleep, and I pulled a chair up to sit down next to the bed. And I was just sitting there. And I've been sitting there praying for about two minutes. I opened my eyes and she's looking at me. 
She said, what are you doing here? I said, Mama, I came home to tell you that I love you. I'm taking a chance on a 15-year-old boy that wasn't no good. But you believed in me and you put me in the pulpit because you saw a calling in me. And I've never thanked you for that. They told me you were going to die. And so I quit my job and I quit college. And I came home to tell you thank you for believing in me. She said, boy, I ain't fixing to die. She said, what's wrong with you? She said, I don't care what a doctor told me. God has the final word in it. Uh, and God ain't finished with me yet. And um, I said, well, I, I'm just telling you what they told me. She said, no, 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 you, you missed the point, son. My faith is still fighting for me. And God's still in control of what's going on. She said, now, get out of here and let me go to sleep. Yes, ma'am. Well, the following Thursday, they, or Wednesday, they discharged her and sent her home from the hospital on a Ferris wheel bed back in the 70s. They had these big beds that would turn you over and do all kind of things. It would stand you up. It would lay you down. It would do, roll you to your stomach. It, would, it was called a Ferris wheel bed. And her medicines in those days, I forget how much it cost every single day for all these medications and the doctor said if she lives and if she stays still for two years, there's a possibility the bone might could fuse itself back somewhere, but she is a total invalid. And so on Wednesday night when we got home, a bunch of us went over to the church and we had a prayer over to her house and we had a prayer meeting. And, um, and then the next night, Thursday night, we had church and they had asked me to preach. And so we went to church that, that night. And uh, I am uh, just walking to the pulpit to take my, my scripture. And we had just had prayer for her earlier in the service. And I, I read my scripture and I read, fight the good fight of faith. The same scripture. And what I didn't know was that at 730, we opened our service with prayer for her. My wife had given her a bath and had washed her hair the day before and fixed it up really, really pretty. First time, got her home from the hospital, and uh, she had fixed her up really nice. And she said at 7.30, she was laying. She said, I looked at the clock and thought, they're having prayer right now. Now, Jesus, I think I'll join my church in prayer right now. Now, God, I'm still your servant, and when you get ready, you'll heal my body. And she said it started with the top of her head and went through her feet a fire that just all of a sudden burned right through her. She said, suddenly, I sat up on the side of the bed and I stood up. The doctor said, I would never stand up again. She said, I started to dance around that room and nobody's at home but me. And she said, I started to have some church. She said, I thought, mm -mm, I'm not going to miss church tonight. She said, I dressed myself. Anyway, I am read that scripture, and the back door came open about the time I read that scripture. And right down the center aisle, she came dancing, talking in tongues. Needless to say, church was over. That was the shortest message I ever preached in my life. Because, you see, Job was dying, and he was having faith that his fight would fight for him. She had her faith to fight for her. He, Job would say, though the skin worms destroy this body, my flesh, I will see the Lord. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The second thing is faith fights the facts. Faith fights the facts. Woo, the doctors had already said she was never, ever, ever going to walk. But faith fights the fact. You know, we believe the news more than we believe the Bible. We really do. David would declare, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor a seed begging bread. Some of you get up every morning believing the devil's going to get you. I'm going to tell you something what ought to happen. Every morning when you roll out of bed and your feet hit the floor, the devil ought to start shaking and say, oh, no, he's getting up again. Oh, no, she's getting up again. Oh, my Lord, no. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Don't let them. Oh, man. Oh, I wish they'd just stay in bed today. I, I was hoping they'd have a migraine today. When their feet hit the floor, uh, the devil, let me tell you something today. Uh, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Some of you go to bed at night worrying whether the booger man's under the bed. 
That's a bunch of hogwash. God gave you something to fight with. Fight, your, your faith fights the facts. It doesn't matter what, what, what the doctor said. It doesn't matter what the boss said when he walked in. We're downsizing. Everybody's going to be losing their jobs. You know what, God, you gave me this when you got another one for me. God, you took care of me. I'm a, the mechanic said my car's not going to run. Okay, God, thank you for this car. It's been a good car. I should have thanked you more for it. But you know what, God, you got another one right down the road for me. I, and God, you know what, it's still better than what it was when I was walking when I got raised up. Uh, we didn't have a car, God, and now I got one, and I'm thankful for what I've got. And God, I want you to know I'm going to bless you uh, whether I got a car or don't have a car, uh, whether I got a house or don't have a house, God. Uh, I don't care what the facts are. My faith will fight those facts third thing is and I got to hurry because I got another service to do faith will help whip your feelings faith will help whip your feelings it will fight your feelings you can't live for God by your feelings I'm going to tell you something you can't live for God by your feelings you, you, you get to living for God by your feelings you're going to be more frustrated than a midget with a yo-yo You'll be more confused than a termite in a yo-yo. You won't know whether you're going up or going down. You just don't know which way you're turning. I'm going to tell you something. Don't let your feelings try to run your body. Don't let your feelings. Let me. I'm going to tell you something right here you need to understand. Fake joy beats real depression any day. I'm going to say that again. Fake joy beats real depression any day. Sometimes you're just going to fake it till you can make it. Now, God, I may not feel like I'm on top of the world today, but you know what? I, I don't care. You know, the, the, the old lady goes to the preacher one day, and then the preacher says to her, Sister, how are you doing? She said, well, under the circumstances, pretty good. He said, what are you doing under there? Think about that. What are you doing under there? I mean, life happens to all of us. When I looked up this morning and I saw Sister Hicks walk into church and I saw Sister Scott walk into church, I'm going to tell you something. I pulled in the parking lot just said, come and I'm saying, God, uh, devil, you missed it again. Uh, you thought you had them. Uh, they've been up all night. Uh, they've just given the greatest gift back to glory that they ever given. But guess what? Uh, they're walking into the house of God to give you some glory, God. Uh, faith will fight uh, those feelings. Uh, those feelings that I'm going to get up and fight again. Uh, I'm not nearly through. Uh, I got more to do oh let me digress just for a moment my mother-in-law told me get out of that room and go home and get some sleep and I preached that Thursday and the, or read the scripture Thursday God healed her body she preached for the next 30 years uh, for 9 years in a row she walked 20 miles uh, for March for missions uh, and raised thousands and thousands of dollars uh, for the missionaries uh, for 30 long years after that uh, she still preached the gospel she preached her last message 7 days before she died Your faith to fight your feelings. Don't you think for a minute that Noah didn't have to fight some feelings in that boat? He worked on that boat for 120 years. He was the only one with a boat in his backyard. There wasn't no water anywhere around. Everybody say, Noah, what you doing? Building an ark. What's an ark? It's a boat. What's a boat? Something's going to float. Noah, are you crazy? I mean, down at the local bar, they were all making jokes about, about Noah. Noah's boys growing up saying, Dad, we're being laughed at. That's okay. That's okay. And do you know something else? When they went into that boat, do you know what happened when they went into the boat? The Bible said God shut the door. All the animals in there. You know what happened the next day? Nothing. You know what happened the next day? Nothing. You know what happened the next day? Nothing. Seven days, nothing happened. People coming up. What y'all doing in there? Hey, Noah. Now, I've been married 47 years this year. I 
about that fourth day, my, my, my sweet little darling wife's going to be looking at me saying, uh, it's going to what? It's going to rain. Uh, what's rain? Because it had never rained up until that time. Read your Bible. Used to preach in a county jail. We had a revival in the county jail when we had eight African-American prisoners that got the Holy Ghost. And, uh, I mean, they got a good dose of Holy Ghost. Matter of fact, we baptized 37 of them in two weeks of, of the prisoners. We, we baptized them in a 55-gallon drum, Brother Scott. It's the only thing we could do, just shove them down there and pull them up by the shirt. Shove them down in Jesus' name, pull them up by the shirt. Shove them down, pull them up by the shirt. And uh, so we showed up one one Sunday, and they said, Hey, preacher boy, I was 19, we got a song for you. I said, You got a song for me? First Sunday I went there, I asked them if anybody had a song they wanted me to sing. See, I used to play an old guitar. I was rough on a guitar. I beat all the strings off of it, flip it over, use the back for a drum. I was rough on a guitar. They'd asked me to sing. Everybody started hiding their guitars. I grew up in a guitar church. They had a bunch of them. They'd hide them. And they said, we want to sing a song for you. I said, okay. So they started singing. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. You better get ready. Bear this in mind. God showed Noah a rainbow sign. He said it won't be water. But fire next time, oh, way back in the Bible days, God told Noah, it's going to rain. Well, Noah he told the people, but they paid him no mind. When the rains came, they were left behind. But I tell you, it's going to rain. It's going to rain. You better get ready. Bear this in mind, God showed Noah. A rainbow sign, he said, it won't be water, but fire next time. Oh, when the rain began to fall, they knocked on the windows and they knocked on the door. But Noah, he said, I'm sorry, my friend, God's got the key and I can't let you in. But I tell you, it's going to rain, it's going to rain, you better get ready. Bear this in mind, God showed Noah a rainbow sign. He said it won't be water, but fire next time. I'm going to tell you something. They began to sing that song. The Holy Ghost began to move. We had four more get the Holy Ghost. The, the warden, the jailer stopped me on the way out, and he said, Preacher boy, I don't know what you've done to those prisoners up there. He said, but they used to fuss and cuss and fight. Uh, they're singing songs. Uh, they're praising God. Uh, they're having prayer meetings. Uh, he said, I don't know what you've done, but keep on doing it. Uh, God's doing something in our jail. Faith will fight your feelings. Noah had to fight some feelings was seven days before the rain started. And it was stinking in there. You ever been around a bunch of animals? You know what animals do? I'll leave it right there. Didn't have a one window. They probably all took turns hanging out the window, trying to breathe. You understand, you got to fight some feelings sometime even in church. Sometimes you get a little cross with a brother or sister in church. You've got to fight some feelings to stay in church. Well, that one hurt my feelings. Get over it. That one didn't speak to me. Get over it. It ain't the end of the world. I had people come up, preacher, I'm not coming back to church. Why? Because you didn't speak to me. Well, you didn't speak to me either. And you get bowed up and mad at me. You got the same clothes get glad in you got mad in. Woo. I done quit preaching, started meddling now. You know, sometimes you got to fight those feelings, but stay in the boat. Whatever you do, stay in the boat. This is the only thing going to get you to heaven. Yeah. Satan will try to tell you a lie. He'll tell you that you're all alone, that nobody loves you. That's a lie from hell. God loves you. Job had to fight some feelings. 
He was basking in the afterglow of a good prayer meeting. He'd offer sacrifices for his kids. Then all of a sudden, the messenger started coming with worse news and worse news and worse. Job had to fight some feelings when he said, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight The fight of faith will help fight your failures. The fight of faith will help fight your failures. Every one of us got failures in life. Every one of us has got failures in our life. We've got times we've struggled. We've got times that we wish we could do it over again. we got times which I wish I could take back what I said. I wish I could redo this all over again. Let me tell you something. Peter... When thou art converted. What do you mean when I'm converted? I've already been converted. I left my boat. I left my nets to fall. I mean, Peter was this big, loud mouth. He was the mouth of the south. I mean, seriously, the only time he opened his mouth was to change feet about half the time. He kept his foot in his mouth. I feel like I can understand. I can relate to Peter. I've been in trouble with my mouth more times than Carter's got little liver pills. And, and Peter, when thou art converted. What? What do you mean? When? Yep, Peter. You're going to fail me. Peter, let your faith fight your failures. Matter of fact, Peter was so distraught after he had failed Jesus. He was so distraught over it. He went back and said, I'm going to go fishing. I'm a failure as a preacher. When Mary came and said, come and see, come and see, come and see, he's risen. Peter ran right down and looked. Jesus said, go and tell the disciples. And Peter, I I preach a message called to Peter with love. It's a love letter from God. He called his name, Peter. Peter said, I'm still a failure. I'm going fishing. And he did. He was out on that boat fishing. Let me tell you something. When you try to run from God, you can get the same results you did before. Broke, busted, and disgusted. He's coming back to shore. Spent a whole night out there. Ain't caught nothing. And all of a sudden, he hears a voice. Children, have you any meat? Catch anything? Nah, not a thing. He said, cast it on the other side. And they cast. And it almost sunk the boat. And it wasn't even Peter. It was one of the other disciples that said, it's got to be Jesus. Peter had already taken off his fishing bone. Peter dove right in the water, swam to shore, and he found Jesus sitting by the fire. He said, I really made a mess of things. I really blew it. Jesus said, Pete, do you love me? I'm sure wasn't much of it at that trial, but Pete, it's you. Peter, do you love me? He's going, yeah, I love you. Listen to me. Peter, do you love me? But God, you don't understand. I've made such a mess of things. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. He said, that's three denials. That's three I love you. Good. Now, I got something I need to do. Quit having a pity party and get ready. I got a message you need to get ready to preach on the day of Pentecost. uh, And it's coming up pretty soon. Uh, Peter, you got to get yourself together. Uh, I'm not through with you. Uh, Faith has got to fight your feelings a little bit. Uh, Come on, let's stand to our feet. Uh, Faith has got to fight your feelings. Uh, We used to sing a song every once in a while. said, faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. Faith, 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 just a little bit of faith. You don't need a whole lot. Just use what you got. Oh, somebody needs to hear me today. You need to get your faith fighting for you. You need to get your faith fighting for you. Something has got to start fighting for you. Uh, When giants come and problems come, your faith has got to kick in and say, Hey, God, uh, I'm going to believe you. Uh, I'm going to trust you. Uh, I'm going to serve you, God. Uh, Come on, I'm talking to somebody today. Uh, Your faith has been waning a little bit. Uh, You begin to wonder what God is doing. Uh, You begin to wonder if God even loves you anymore. Uh, You wonder if God's left you. Uh, I got news for you. Uh, You better suit up and get ready to fight again. 
around. Uh, that's that stinking feelings that you're fighting. Uh, that's that unbelief you're fighting. Uh, that's the facts you're fighting. Uh, that's your failures you're fighting. Uh, you got to get your faith uh, and say, God, I need that faith to fight for me today. Come on, let's praise him together. Come on, let's praise him together. Come on, let's praise him. <laughs>